Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Lavinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to welcome Hermione Hobby and Katie Kitamura for a discussion of Tova Ditlevson's masterpiece, The Copenhagen Trilogy, which is already one of our favorite books of the year. Um, while the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. And I want to give a huge thanks to Hermione and Katie for joining us this evening. Um, so to a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you, if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We will try to get through as many of those as we can at the end of the program. There's also a chat button down here uh, through which I'll be posting a link to purchase the Copenhagen Trilogy, if you haven't already, uh, along with some pre-order links for Hermione and Katie's upcoming books, um, which serendipitously we were just discussing are coming out on the same day in July. So you can really get two for the price of one on that day, uh, or two for the price of two. So, um, <laughs> a caveat for tonight's event and for all of our virtual events, um, we are all of us at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise. We will try to solve them quickly. And finally, we've uh, scheduled a whole host of spring programming. So head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. Um, next Thursday, we are thrilled to welcome Anaconda Schofield to present her new novel, Bina, A Novel in Warnings, in conversation with Olive Bachman, uh, as part of our ongoing series with our friends at NYRB. Again, this is up on our website now, so head over and register as soon as we wrap up. So now a little about tonight's guest and we will get started. Hermione Hobby is the author of the novel Neon and Daylight, which was twice listed as a New York Times Editor's Choice Award or choice. Uh, her second novel, Virtue, will be published by Riverhead Books in July. Her writing has uh, appeared in Harper's, The Guardian, The New York Times, The New Yorker, and Freeze. Raised in London, she lives in Colorado. And Katie Kitamura's most recent novel, A Separation, was a finalist for the Premio von Rizzori and a New York Times notable book. It was translated into 16 languages and is being adapted for film. Katie teaches in the creative writing program at New York University, and her novel, her new novel, Intimacies, will be published by Riverhead Books in July. So, Katie and Hermione, the stage is yours. Thanks so much, Hal. Um, this is my first Zoom event, so um, it, yeah, it does feel a little strange. I feel like I'm talking to myself, but I'm glad I'm... In Definitely talking to you, Katie. I know that you- <laughs> I'm gonna make lots of active facial responses throughout. <laughs> yeah, thank you, that would be great. Um, so thank you, Hal, thank you, um, Community Bookstore, and thank you, FSG, for putting this extraordinary book out in the world. I'm so glad it um, is out in the world. And uh, much as I you know, wish we were all crowded into Community Bookstore, which is one of my favorites, drinking some wine out of plastic cups, it is lovely thinking that you know, hopefully you out there are joining us from all sorts of places. Um, so welcome and um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, I think it's, um, I haven't told you this, Katie, um, I think it's, but I'll, I'll tell this brief story yeah. because I think it's a kind of, um, you know, testament to the phenomenal nature of this book in many ways. Um, about four or five months ago, I, I got an advanced copy and was blown away by it and <laughs> emailed like a succession of editors wanting to write about it. And they'd all already commissioned pieces, Maybe. which I think <laughs> tells us, you know, um, quite, quite um, how electrifying this book has been to so many people. Mm -hmm. um, and Katie, you, um, we, we agreed that we were both just wrapped from the first few pages. So I wonder if you want to just read the first few pages. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, first of all, it's so nice to see your face. I think the yeah, last time we, um, I mean, we the last time we talked properly is uh, when uh, we did the event for Yuko Tsushima's book, Territory of Light, oh which God, is another yeah. kind of extraordinary um, book in translation that is yeah. also kind of has elements of autofiction or memoir and is, is very much about female experience. So it's it's nice to be talking to you about this book, which in Again, they share some some qualities, but it's very, very different in a lot of ways as well. Um, I mean, I absolutely had that experience, you know, I had such an immersive, intense uh, experience with this book. And yeah. I think really almost from the very first sentence, from the first page, I had that almost physical tingling uh, that you mm -hmm. get when you're reading something that's really rare and extraordinary. And so, yeah, when uh, you said, when we kind of agree that we read, um, from the book, I thought I'd just read from the very first chapter of the first volume, which is called Childhood. Um, and, you know, I, 
when I went back and reread the first chapter, I mean, it's even more extraordinary than I had really understood on the first read. I mean, it's it's really incredibly complex. It's kind of technically brilliant. And it's just it's just one of the kind of best things I've read in a really long time. So I'm just going to read the last um, page of it. Cool. When hope had been crushed like that, my mother would get dressed with violent and irritated movement, as if every piece of clothing were an insult to her. I had to get dressed too, and the world was cold and dangerous and ominous because my mother's dark anger always ended in her slapping my face or pushing me against the stove. She was foreign and strange, and I thought that I had been exchanged at birth and she wasn't my mother at all. When she was dressed, she stood in front of the mirror in the bedroom, spit on a piece of pink tissue paper, and rubbed it hard across her cheeks. I carried the cups out to the kitchen and inside of me long mysterious words began to crawl across my soul like a protective membrane, a song, a poem, something soothing and rhythmic and immensely pensive, but never distressing or sad as I knew the rest of my day would be distressing and sad. When these light waves of words streamed through me, I knew that my mother couldn't do anything else to me because she'd stop being important to me. My mother knew it too, and her eyes would fill with cold hostility. She never hit me when my soul was moved in this way, but she didn't talk to me either. From then on, until the following morning, it was only our bodies that were close to each other. And in spite of the cramped space, they avoided even the slightest contact with each other. The sailor's wife on the wall still watched longingly for her husband, but my mother and I didn't need men or boys in our world. Our peculiar and infinitely fragile happiness thrived only when we were alone together. And when I stopped being a little child, it never really came back except in rare occasional glimpses that have become even more dear to me now that my mother is dead and there is no one to tell her story as it really, sorry, as it really was. Um, so that's the very end of the first chapter. Yeah, yeah. It, um, hearing you, you read that, I'm just reminded of how wonderfully tonally different the three sections of this book are, which were initially published in three different sections. And it seems, you know, I've just been kind of back in the last section, which is yes. so cool and extraordinary. And it's quite amazing that in the first, there is, you know, there is a feeling of childhood in the prose, the kind of um, associative, dreamy. Um, I mean, there's something, there's a kind of magic, you know, that I, I'm now I'm going to butcher the phrase, but she says something about the kind of, um, you know, like the scrim between her and the world and words. Yes. And it. Well, I mean, that incredible uh, first protective membrane that the, that the kind of early act of writing in her head is already a kind of protection and a distance and a kind of separation between her and this world that is brutalizing her in, in so many ways. And I, I think it was, I mean, I absolutely agree. It's extraordinary. I think, I think I'm right in thinking that childhood and youth were published together and then dependency was a separate, separate book. I'm not entirely sure. I, I think that might be the case, but you're, I think you're absolutely right that they are so distinct and they capture um, the respective ages of, of, of Tolva, the character, um, yeah. really incredibly. And I think, you know, dependency to me was such a staggering, show-stopping piece of writing, you know, that, mm -hmm. that kind of, it kind of affected me on a really physical level. I mean, I'm getting kind of anxious <laughs> thinking about it even yeah. now, but yeah. it was, it was interesting to look at childhood again, because it is exactly that kind of dr beautiful drift of thought. And then the layers that she writes in, um, that captures so much what it is like to be a child. And I, I was trying to think of, you know, what I, how I would describe the experience of reading these books. And I think it's really, the, was like a return to being a kind of pure reader, yes. um, you know, just a kind of consciousness that briefly has access to another consciousness. And that's really a way of reading that I associate with, with childhood, you know, when, when, I was, when I was a child, I read ravenously and, and books were everything to me. They were my way of, they were a lifeline. They were my way of accessing the world. And so I think when you, when you, you know, what you just said about how she captures that feeling of childhood, I think that's part of the reason why right away from the very first page, I was back in that sensation of having that intense experience with language and storytelling. Yeah, yeah. I think um, when I was, thinking about you know the the way these three are titled mm. 
Um, well, it's, I mean, this has very much been um, acknowledged and written about, but it's perhaps worth mentioning here that my understanding is that um, in Danish, dependency um, was called gift, which is this wonderful homonym, meaning both poison and marriage, um, which is, you know, it kind of forms this like bleak feminist joke, but uh, it's entirely appropriate to that section in which um, the marriage is one of poison quite literally um, she um, you know marries this guy because he's a doctor and has access to Demerol um, to which she becomes instantly addicted um, but the, I, one of the things that struck me about her childhood is the sort of lack of dependency and there's something poignant about the final volume in which she is ostensibly an adult but in many ways a child um, in terms of her addiction um, you know, th that is called dependency, but her childhood, I mean, I found it so painful when she's, um, I think she's 14 and her mother takes her to buy a pair of shoes and says, this is the last pair of shoes we're getting you because you're on your own, you know, um, and 14 to me still <laughs> seems like a child, but her childhood is um, not exactly one of dependence, um, or at least her teenhood certainly isn't one of mm -hmm. dependence. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about that. I mean, one of the, the, the kind of meticulous attention, I, I think, you know, we, there are a lot of stories about writers wanting to become writers. I think, you know, that's a kind of classic narrative. But, but one thing I really noticed is that she's not, she, it's not only that she wants to become a writer, it's that she wants to become a writer who earns money. Totally. And I think that element from very, very early on in the childhood, where it is at 14, you're, you're on your own is, is really, um, finds an expression in the relationship to work. And part of what she wants, she thinks, she wants to be able to think, I, I think, <laughs> of, of writing as work, as a profession, as, as labor, as, as paid labor. And, and that was felt to me very much the kind of um, trained independence, I suppose, yes. of, of that childhood. I mean, I, I found the opening section, I think one of the things that really enraptured me was this incredibly, um, complex relationship with her mother which she absolutely nails just even in that opening chapter where there's a kind of constant um you know her her mother is is mercurial she's volatile and the child is constantly negotiating and reacting to that and i think you're you're right that in a funny way that immediately uh trains her to create create this distance which she uses language to create um, through this kind of protective membrane but mm -hmm. she, she finds an independence in part I think um, because of the uh, intensity and the volatility of that of that core relationship which for me the first volume seems to me very much about about the relationship with the mother yeah right right and in terms of the um, I mean one of the many things I admired um, in, I was going to say, in terms of the, um, you know, the, her desire to make money, yeah. there's just this wonderful, um, frank pragmatism and opportunism. Um, and perhaps the most striking bit is when she just very bluntly says she will marry the editor sight unseen because she knows, and that's the phrase sight unseen, because she thinks, well, he'll serve her, you know, he'll be a financial support and he'll be a, a kind of professional support. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, I think, you know, the content of this, particularly of dependency is so shocking. And the reason it works, um, and I guess this is a sort of truism of workshop or, you know, craft talks. Um, it seems like, you know, the more lurid and shocking the content, uh, the better you've got to be, the better you need to be at um, extremely disciplined, um, uh, straightforward prose. And she is incredible at that. I mean, I think that's what struck me most of all in the, the final section, this, um, this real frankness. Um, and I think it's that that, you know, sort of makes this book to my mind um, a moral object because it is so amoral, because it is just this account Mm -hmm. um without a kind of forced narrativizing um it does feel it felt at several points to me more like a chronicle than a, a his history you know um I don't know if that struck you um particularly in the, the last section yeah no I mean I, I think there are two two things um from what you said is so fascinating 
absolutely I agree with you about the pragmatism that, of, of her of her relationship to her work and I would add that there's a kind of ruthlessness which um, yeah. gave me such a thrill as a reader and I think even you know I noticed in, in the section that I, that I just read the last this line you know um, these occasional glimpses that have become even more dear to me now that my mother is dead and there is no one to tell her story as it really was and so I, like that at first glance sounds like it's it, this is going to be a story of recuperation where she's going to tell the yeah. story of her mother yeah. she, but it's absolutely not that at all she's she really means that literally no one is there is there to tell the story and the story she's going to tell is actually the story about herself and and then when you were talking about um kind of the language of, of, of workshop or the language of craft i think one of the things that i absolutely thrilled to in in this book was her complete lack of uh interest in in what what we would call narrative continuity like the yeah. children disappear for pages and pages at a time and i and i you know I, I i i did find myself thinking if i were you know reading something like this in you know in a, in a workshop i would probably say where are the kids or where are the husbands or how did this really all these kind of questions yeah. that are actually extremely irrelevant to creating the intensity of the world and i and i think you know I'll, i think she's an incredibly um, a disciplined writer. I think it's really interesting that you said that because I think it's easy to think that the because it is so immediate and so in some ways naturalistic, I think it's almost easy to overlook the incredible artfulness that is absolutely going into every single yeah. Yeah. sentence and every single page. The, the way she constructs not only a different voice, but a different way of telling the story for each different mm -hmm. section um, and how I mean, how technically difficult that is to be able to write in, in, in all these ways, very, very effortlessly. Yeah. Um, I, I've lost my train of thought, but, but absolutely. I mean, the risk, I, I suppose in, in dependency, the, the um, irony, the restraint of the prose against the kind of um, subject matter is, is, is exceptionally noticeable. I, I yeah, think yeah. Right. I think it really hit me because um, I guess I've been thinking about um, uh, a kind of prurience around female suffering and, um, you know, a, a wrongheaded moral authority that we accord suffering as though there is something inherently ennobling about going through something terrible. Um, and at, by which I guess I mean, you know, the kind of specter of the triumph of content over form. And I think what she does here is just a refutation of all that, you know? Um, these, uh, yeah, these extreme things happen and we have a sense that she is not making meaning in any effortful way. And she has that amazing line um, about childhood. Um, I wonder if I've written it down. It's something like, it has no meaning, you just get through it. It's so like blunt. Mm -hmm. um, but I sort of felt that that line kind of cast this light throughout the book for me mm -hmm. in terms of meaning. And um, just, I, I think there is, I mean, we yeah, we were just talking about this, the sort of art of omission, and that is what creates the meaning, mm -hmm. um, not a belaboring of pain, mm -hmm. which of course there is plenty of. Yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it, it's it's really um, a kind of fascinating object in a way. It, it, it's you know it's a, it's a narrative that I think has is so powerful that it has had a, a real effect in the sense that you know abortion laws were changed as a result right. of, the, of the abortion scene that you know and 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 I think certainly as a kind of uh, example of of gaslighting, it's one of the most you know I I think as I wrote to somebody that. The only book that has kind of destabilized me in, in this in a similar way is probably Natalia Ginsburg's The Dry Heart, where mm -hmm. I had such a profound uh, uh, sense of, of unease and kind of almost physical malaise yeah. reading that. But I, I think, you know, this is not a, a redemption narrative by any any <laughs> any stretch of the imagination. And I and and I think and I think it's not even 
there, there's a narrative that something that goes, I think something like in the writing is an act of redemption or something like that, right? Like, mm -hmm. like well, you survived to tell the story and now you are telling the story and in the act of telling the story, you are reclaiming the narrative. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't sense that to be part of the project in any way. If anything, mm -hmm. it seems to me that the, the distance that, that language and words and writing creates from the world is actually the exact distance that allowed her Mm. Um, to become an addict quite deliberately. I mean, I, I, for me, somehow those two things are related. So it, it's not that the kind of act of writing and the passion of writing has has literally has has been able to. It's not that in reading dependency we are reading the the work of someone who's triumphed over addiction by any stretch of the imagination. It seems to me like it's almost the same psychological structures that allowed her to write and 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 drove her to write are are, are similar in in. in are similarly at work in a way in the addiction and it is the way that you know the her addiction to Denmark kind of removes her from her life is something that you see established from the very very start of the book but in relation to writing absolutely um, yeah yeah but I, I think I think you're right you know that there's this kind of school of 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 writers that um that maybe people like um Jean Reese or um, Duras, you might put in that, and and it's it's it is. I think you you're right that there is a kind of almost prurient interest in 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 their uh, you know alcoholism or, or whatever happened in in their in their lives. Um, and it, it there is an irony in the fact that these are like just some of the most unsentimental writers that I could think of. I mean, they they are the most unromantic uh, right. writers about the conditions of their own life, and I think. Yeah. You're absolutely right. You know, all, all of those writers refuse the temptation to create meaning where there is no meaning. Right. I think I, one of the things I was struck by was um, I was thinking about self pity in the book, yeah. and you know, I thought what what makes one of the things that makes it so amazing is um, oh, I hate this word, but you know, the unflinching quality of the writing. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's so frank, and um, as we talked about, there is a sense of artlessness to it. But, you know, when you actually, I mean, there's a difference between the, the prose and then what's happening because she is actually quite self-pitying, particularly when it comes to men. And there's so much, um, you know, um, we forgive her this because we see where this has come from, but these truly conventional desires, she just wants to be looked after and married and have children and be respectable in that way. Um, I wonder, actually, I might just, well, if it's not too tedious, read a bit from yeah. from the middle, because um, I guess this it kind of speaks to that. So this is from Youth, um, which is sort of surprisingly funny at um, many points, and part of that. Whole, I mean, it's funny even in dependency. I mean, the entire the entire book is extremely funny. Yeah. Who wouldn't? Who would think that four divorces and intense demoral addiction came with the lols? Um, <laughs> it does. Um, so she's, I think now she's a, she's maybe about 19 and um, she is waiting um, for her poem to be published in the journal. So I'll just read like a page. Um, she's looking at dogs on the street. Some of the dogs have a short leash that's jerked impatiently every time they stop. Others have a long leash and their masters wait patiently whenever an exciting smile detains the dog. That's the kind of master I want. That's the kind of life I could thrive in. There are also the masterless dogs that run around confused between people's legs, apparently without enjoying their freedom. I'm like that kind of masterless dog, scruffy, confused, and alone. I go out in the evening less often than before, and Nina says I'm getting to be downright boring. I stay in my room now that the cold doesn't chase me out anymore. I read my poems over and over again, and sometimes I write a new one. The two that were, to put it mildly, not good, I've long ago removed from my collection. I think they were hideous, but if the editor had written that they were good, I would have believed him. Um, I just found that so striking. And then what follows from this, and I won't read because it goes on too long, is this um, quite extraordinary discussion with her parents about her marrying this editor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, they're just kind of deciding her fate um, her mother's encouraging her uh, to quit her job and be provided for. Mm -hmm. um, but this stuff about the dogs, I just think, um, 
this uh, this really speaks to the um, the sort of ethos of the whole book, which is you know you there is this real simplicity of diction, a kind of ingenuousness, but with that ingenuousness, there is this sense of her as being like a little clueless, like sort of vulnerable. Um, and then in the dog, I just thought there is this funny mixture of, you know, the kind of humdrum and cute and appealing, like who doesn't love a scruffy dog, mm -hmm. but also pretty abject, you know, to be a dog with a master. And this is her stated wish to be, mm -hmm. well, either, um, yeah, to be a, so she wants to be, um, you know, she wants to have this kind of master, but she's a masterless dog. Mm -hmm. um, how, how much did you read that um, preoccupation with marriage as, as as kind of the only route out of the household for her? Oh, very much. Is yeah. that because yeah. that's kind of how the kind of is a kind of chain reaction of. of of, 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 of almost like her mother is telling her to get out of the house. Yeah. It's, it's literally the only option she has to, no, to escape so, this oppressive you're household. So, you're so right, and I don't want to spend <laughs> time about it. But I think what's interesting is that it persists. Yes, um, yes. You know, it's like, need, she keeps needing a husband. And again, that's, that's yes. you know, this is, it was not 2020 back then. Yes. Um, we, we, I, we uh, you know, give, give latitude in terms of yeah I mean one of the things that was so interesting to me in in at the end of dependency which I, I felt like again was one of these wonderfully um, um just uh uh idiosyncratic isn't the right word but it, it was just really as if she was writing for herself and and mm. without interest in the kind of conventions of of of, of storytelling is when she introduces yeah. the, the last husband Mm. Um, whose name I now I can't I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I can't even remember the kind of wonderful oh, yeah. husband was what was it was um the one after Carl the doctor but she oh, had like Eddie I, 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 don't, I, I don't know if I wrote, Victor. Um, Victor Victor is kind of introduced you know you know I mean he he's summed up in a few lines and he sounds uh the kind of narrative function or position he serves is kind of the prince prince he sweeps in and <laughs> yeah. but but it's also like she she could care less how they really met or how they fell in love yeah. it's kind of of secondary interest to her and yeah. i think you're absolutely right the facts of her life are are um you know she went she, she does seem to have been married for quite a lot of her life to to um she uh, you know for 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 i i for whatever those reasons are I was fascinated by the way she told the story of, of each partner, which was sometimes there was almost a lack of interest in, in, in that. I mean, she exits out of marriages in this kind of wonderful way where she's not interested in really telling us how she yeah. left that partner. And, and that, that kind of uh, um, ruthlessness of, yeah. of storytelling, I, I, I really, really loved. Um, but I, I agree, I mean, when you were reading that, um, description of, of, of being a masterless dog versus a, a dog with a master. I, it, you know, it was it was striking to me absolutely. I mean, it was. I mean, I was thinking, you know, the Elena Ferrante books are are interesting because also in the especially in the last volumes, it is a classic. The narrative is a classic love triangle. It is a classic. The kind of tension in the book is who is going to end up with with um, Salvatore and 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 I. I I, that is, that is, I, I real, to me, to some extent, as a reader, the reason why I'm, I'm reading in, in some ridiculous way is, is the kind of power of this classic narrative trope. And I, I think one of the things that I admired and found very unique about the storytelling here is there seemed to be such a lack of milking the various love narratives for, for very much <laughs> for very much tension at all. I mean, I never really found myself wanting to know, is she going to, that, that wasn't where the tension of the story was mm -hmm. for me somehow. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how, how, how you experienced no, that. I, that. That all resonates with me. And I think one of the, the pleasures of this book is, is the diaristic sense. And, yes. you know, I, I, keep, um, I keep a kind of Google doc of a diary and in my most shameful, vainglorious moments, I'll be like, oh God, if anyone reads this after I've died, they'll be like, 
she barely even mentions Trump, you know? And I think this is like true of people's diaries. That's just like, you don't talk about, even if you're thinking about them and talking about them in your diary, you don't write about the grand events um, yeah. with you seriousness. You're just like, you know, bitching about your friend or not that I do that, but you know, it's like <laughs> it's the petty and the immediate that you write about. And yeah. so when you said earlier that she seems to be writing for herself, I, I think that's what yes. you said. That, that to me is just, yes, so true. And I think in that way, there is almost, um, there's almost like a little, and I do mean this as a compliment, but like the sort of thrill of the voyeuristic because you feel like it hasn't been shaped for the reader, that there is, it's just a sort of direct mm -hmm. um, access to her mm -hmm. being, or at least mm -hmm. that was the impression mm -hmm. I got, which of course comes about through all the, the artfulness. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I read this back to back with Annie Erno's um, oh. A Girl's Story, which I-, I, I was gonna talk to you Did about. you do the same thing? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Um, I uh, which, and I don't, did you notice that in the, the, the epigraph for that is, is a Yuko Tsushima quote? No. A girl story. It is. I don't actually have my copy. Oh my God, it all adds but, up. But it's it all, yeah, it's kind of all <laughs> cosmically lines. And, and, and which, which is, I think, you know, um, I think there are definite kind of, the two writers share so many preoccupations and in some ways the projects are very similar, but yeah. that, um, crafting and, 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 Profound retrospective point of view, which is which is how that what novel. Sorry, I, they are are they categorized? I don't know if they're categorized. Yeah, as I've been wanting to call it a novel. I think um, I mean with both of them, with both Erno and uh, Listen, I don't know. You can call it a book, but, but, but that book, <laughs> um, I I think, which is so much about kind of the confrontation with the um, past self and the judgment on the past self and it's actually that is when you were saying that there is no um judgment in, or no moral lesson or no meaning that that she's creating i think that's absolutely right and 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 if you look you know both those books they involve the writer putting in their earlier work um you know whether it's i think I, in fact i think possibly both poems and but yeah. but certainly with Annie, i think they're the letter she, she puts in her own letters um yeah and 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 there's so much profound shame for her in that confrontation with the younger self that it's almost unbearable. And, and she has to write a, about that younger version of herself in the third person. And that is almost the opposite here. It's that's been collapsed so that those, you know, I mean, like at, at moments I think it pulls up, but they, it does retain that proximity and there isn't that um, kind of molding or, or, or grooming of the self image, which is done in such a kind of, um, really beautiful but but very opposing way I think in, in something so, somebody like Annie Erno's work. Yeah I was thinking when I was thinking about Annie Erno and, yeah. and Whitlison and, and yeah. how they might illuminate each other it, it sort of struck me that um, a girl's story at least seems almost like a kind of historiography of self like if this is a chronicle if not a history yeah. of self yeah. then she is um, it's so refracted in in yes. the in girl's story um and as you say there's that amazing third person phenomenon happening um which is true i mean you know i feel like who is she when i think back to whatever i mean i have that when i looked at my emails from about a month ago <laughs> it was that maniac who sent that email um yeah, but I mean, time is doing some strange things in lockdown that's for sure. i mean it, it's it's also you know because the other um there's that other incredible um annie or no book which I think is is different. I think the English title is A Man's Place, which is which is which does almost exactly what Tolvi Ditlevson says. I'm she's not going to do, which is it does this beautiful, loving recuperation of the father's life, you know, in, in this working class French family, and it, and it's so um, incredibly moving, and it is entirely about him, but it is very much um, in the telling. You learn a great deal about their relationship, and I think that the impulse here is very very different. There's that yeah. kind of that that gesture is not part of this project, and I, I think how 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 did I? I mean, I'm I'm trying to think of your 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 question about you know whether there's something almost voyeuristic about reading it, and I'm I'm trying. I mean, I I, I think I find almost every <laughs> I think I find every book I read every really good book I read voyeuristic because it is I think it has given to me that. access yeah to some, like, like a really good like a very like a very intense very good 
a reading experience for me is actually when I feel like I'm seeing something that maybe shouldn't be seen. Um, yeah. And sometimes even that is, uh, that is in somebody who, in a, not somebody, but in, in a kind of narration that is quite cautious, I can still feel that. And I think Annie Arno is an example of that. It is very um, refracted and it is very formal. And there is a distance between Annie Arno, the great woman of French yeah. letters and, and, and little, or whatever, whatever that I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, I can't remember what her, her, her name was as a child, but there, there is that distance, but that, that tells me so much. That seems to be a story in, in itself. That was where the real kind of piercing for me was, is, is in that shame and that distance and that need to kind of cultivate and curate. And so I think for me, every good book gives me that thrill of voyeurism in, yeah. in some way or another, I think. Yeah, I think, um as you said I'm like oh damn yes me too that's what it is I mean I have this this quite physical sensation and we were talking at the beginning of this conversation yeah. about the physical responses and you know mine is a sense of vertigo but I do think that comes from the same thing of just like oh my god I'm seeing the truth and you know the truth is yeah. indigenous and dazzling yeah. and uh, frightening and yeah it's that sense um do you think we should uh, take a look at some questions? I meant to say earlier, please, um, you know, volley your thoughts, observations, questions. Um, I have um, in my first book, I have a bit of a cheap joke about someone at a reading saying this is more a comment than a question, which I feel like, you know, is a crime, but I actually feel like when the author isn't present, it's not a crime. I don't know if you agree with me, Katie, but I would say, come, come with the comments, not questions. Uh, I, I, I worry that when I, when I interview people, I, I like vomit my thoughts to them about their work. And then I say, do you have any thoughts on that? And then they just look at me like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, I once, I once it, this amazing um, interview with Ben Lerner. Yeah, I think it was in the White Review, an excellent publication, no shade. But the interviewer asks a question that is sort of this long on the page and then Ben Lerner says, yes. I just thought that was sublime. Um, it's wonderful. Anyway, should we take a look at- well, I, I absolutely agree with you. In, 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 um, in, especially with this event and this book, I feel like, um, people should make make statements rather than comments rather than questions. <laughs> Grand but, statement. But, um, let's see. Um, I probably should have done this sooner to take yeah. a look. Um, anonymous attendee, how exciting, says, can you each discuss how you first came to Dit Libsen work, Dit Libsen's work? Um, had you been hearing about it before it came into English? Um, so yeah, I guess we talked about this a tiny bit, but Katie, tell me what I think I, I um, first came to the work because of, um, and I'm, I apologize because I will be mispronouncing the name, Dorta Norris. Oh yeah. Um, the short story writer, or, or, or I, 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 I've only read her short story, right? Um, I think, and I think she, I believe she has a new collection coming out imminently, newly translated into English. And, and I always remember that she said that it, she was a writer um, who was reviled by the male establishment and revered by the female writers of, of um, Dorta Noor's generation. Um, and, and it was clearly such a seminal text. And then I have heard about it, I think possibly to some extent in conversations in, in relationship to, to my struggle, I think as a kind of uh, a, a key text um, that related to that project, but that had not perhaps been fully placed into that context for the English mm -hmm. language. Well, pretty that's serendipitous because, yes. uh, as you may, <laughs> um, Jay Ruiz, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, um, says, inevitably, this has already been compared to the work of Knausgaard. Is there any productive sense in which we can contrast their two approaches to recasting life in narrative? That's a nice phrase, recasting mm -hmm. life in narrative. It really is. <laughs> Such a nice moment. This is a moment where I wish I could talk to Jay Ruiz and and hear more of that lovely yeah. language. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, you know, it's funny. I asked. I I did an event with 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 Karlova, and I asked I asked him why those books were novels rather than memoir. Mm. Yeah. Which, looking back, I think is is a really stupid and annoying question. Um, yeah. But he he said that it was because they used novelistic techniques, um, which which I think is is true. Um, and 
I, I think these books is very hard for me, which I, I think are, are, are technically considered memoir, but they do do much the same thing. They use they use novelistic um, yeah. techniques. And so, sorry, that's not answering the question at all. It was just making me think about how, um, I, I don't know how important it would be considered that my struggle is presented as a fictional project rather than a, than a right. memoir. I don't know, how, how many, sorry, do I mean, you have I, did, I, don't I don't know how significant this is, but I did keep catching myself, you know, when I was talking about this to friends, referring it to as a novel, referring mm -hmm. to it as a novel and then realizing, of course, it is, it is not. But perhaps this is, <laughs> that might be, because I think I have some, um, I think I have some slight prejudice about memoir, which is quite, shameful um <laughs> but i just so i just didn't want to think of this as a memoir because it seemed to me i don't know um so much more thrilling than i could possibly imagine a memoir could be um yeah i was i was thinking about that you know and, and trying to um especially right now this uh you know memoir auto fiction and fiction are, are all very proximate in, in a lot of ways and I was trying to understand actually what makes defines a genre and I think primarily in my experience what defines it I mean to, to me I'm, I'm slightly thinking I, to me genre is like a set of expectations that you bring to a text in in some yeah. way and I think with with memoir there can be an expectation that it will in part because of you know it's not this kind of act of memory and we talked a little bit about how to have writing can be typecast as a kind of recuperative action. Yeah. I think there is often, I mean, I, if, if it, you know, when you say that you don't like or, or read very much memoir, this kind of, there can be an assumption that there is some kind of redemptive yes. or recuperative quality to it, which these books absolutely do not have. And I would say my struggle also absolutely d does not have. But, and I, and, I, and I wonder if that is in so, some way the only kind of, you know, it's a very permeable, bar permeable barrier between the two. I mean, I also wonder if we think of it as novels, we think of them as novels because we're novelists. <laughs> and it's just some kind of terrible narcissism where we want to try to claim so this terrible. brilliant piece of work as a piece of fiction because we yeah. write fiction. Like, you know, when you have a physical ailment and you go to the osteopath and they say it's to do with your bones and you go to the nutritionist and they say it's to do with yeah. your diet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which we see the world uh yeah <laughs> um all right let me take another look see what else people are saying um oh this is cool um i hope it's not feeding our terrible narcissism but uh, <laughs> anonymous attendee says is there anything in diplison style or approach form that either of you feel might make it into your own work or more generally does reading her work feel inspiring to your own work as novelists? Um, I think we, when we were first talking, Katie, we were like, well, why is it so amazing? <laughs> and I think um, it's often, it's a tricky thing sometimes to read something as brilliant as this. Um, you know, depending on my mood, I can either feel like so inspired and I do feel that mostly, but you can also feel like, oh God, how did she do it? I'll never do it. <laughs> what was um, what was your reaction in terms of how this might inflect your work or speak to your work? I mean, I, w I was thinking about actually, and this is maybe to respond a little bit more to the, the previous question, but I I mean, one quality that I think both Ditlifson and Canals God really have is that they can make anything interesting. And I think yeah. Yeah. anything, literally anything. And, and I, that was really what I what struck me when I was reading my struggle. I, I remember the first time I was reading, I was in a like in a in a, a a house with some other writers, and you know the book hadn't come out in English yet, and and people were kind of saying, "What are you reading?" And I and I don't know what's it like. And I said, "I, I don't know." There's a hundred pages about hiding beer bottles in the snow, and, mm. and I don't know why I'm still reading on some level, but I am still reading. And they were saying, stop reading. And I said, no, but it's really, and, and I found the same thing with this, where she could just be recounting anything and something about, about, about this, the storytelling quality of observation um, is, is so extraordinary that you are absolutely compelled. I mean, these are both writers who do not require plot or conventional tension as we think of it, all, all, all of those things that you, you kind of associate with a the structure of the novel. They don't they don't need any of those. Although I should add, I mean, dependency is, is like a brilliantly structured formal piece of, of plotting intention, obviously. 
Um, and that I, I feel like I fear is not something that you can learn. <laughs> that, that ability to make telling, the telling of anything so fascinating, yeah. um, to make that be enough it is something that I, I, you know, reading both these, those writers, I never think, oh, I, 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 there's a little trick I could, yeah. I could pick up. You know, there's, yeah. a, there's a nice little, you know, device that I could use. I, I, I really never felt that. Um, yeah. But I think both, for me, it is almost a, a more, almost a more moral or, I, I, is, is I feel like they, they, they don't leave anything on, on the field, if you know what I mean, as, as writers. And I think yeah. that kind of um, intensity of commitment is something that I think is very inspiring for any writer, even even if those specifics of what she's doing are, are kind of impossible to replicate for most for most people, certainly for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of spirit of it um, is is inspiring to me. I don't. How did you? How do you? How did you feel? Um, well, I was uh, I was just gonna say when you you know when you mentioned that Canals God hiding the beer bottles in the snow. You know, it's so long since I read my struggle, um, and I was like, oh God, can I even remember? And as soon as you said that, it came mm. back to me with the flavor of memory. Um, mm. It felt like something I had lived, such was the mm. sort of vivid quality. Mm. And I think that is testament to Canals God. And I'm, I know that I'm gonna have the same experience with this book. Mm. Um, you know, with certain scenes, there is just that indelible quality. And yeah, if I, if I knew how to do that, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be copying it. Um, but it's just, um, it's, I think it is to do, well, you know, I was thinking about, um, <laughs> there's, there's the bit in uh, childhood when her brother discovers her poems and he's sort of, you know, shrieking with derisive laughter and she's filled with shame. And then he bursts into tears and he calls, he has called the poems lies. He says, he's laughing because he says, you're full of lies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we read these poems, these very childhood and truly poems of childhood, she's like 10, I think, um, there is, um, you know, I'm like, oh, the, the kind of cringe, the like bullshitic poems that a little kid would write. Um, so, but I think what's so amazing about that scene with the brother is that it's, oh, it's my sense that he bursts into tears because he sees that she has a vocation yeah. and she has, um, she's like creating a selfhood and this poor guy, her poor brother gets a kind of lung disease, I think, yeah. from, from working in a factory. It's just so brutal and awful and he has no way out, but she has this way out both practically, which is becoming, you know, literally a professional poet and being remunerated, but um, a kind of spiritual way out too. Mm -hmm. Um, wow, I've strayed so far from the question. What were you talking no, about? No, no, I mean, I, I was, I, as you were saying that, I was thinking for, for me, the really extraordinary, it's that thing you, you said, the really extraordinary books are the ones that, where you confuse them with your own yeah. life. And, and, and Michael Wood, the, the literary critic, um, ha has this lovely phrase where I've read so many brilliant books that, that half of what I think I've lived, I've only actually read. Yeah. And, and I think I, I, I agree, I had that, that completely, um, with, with with these books where there were there was so the particularity and the um the precision with which she renders these little moments which are small moments that many people would not even think to put into a book it is is heartbreaking and staggering and and for me i had you know i mean i think i read i i read that especially the first section in a kind of funny states halfway between um remembering my own childhood and my own relationship to my parents. And then also this terrible anxiety of, of what I might be myself right now as a mother and, and that kind of, you know, <laughs> mercurial, you know, all, all of those things. And it, and it was, it was one of those reading experiences where I found myself constantly almost searching the book for clues about my own life, I yeah. think. Um, and, and that was that, that I, I, I thought was extraordinary. I mean, yeah, the, the answer about, whether it might make it into my own work, I is is I dream, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> right, same. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I uh, I when I read something truly amazing, I sometimes have that sense of the book is seeing me. You know, 
it's like uh, looking into my soul yeah. and that's um that's the real yeah i mean i think it would it's it, it, i do think it's one of these these um, mirror texts where you can find out a lot about a person by the section they choose uh -oh. I think. like like no but I, but I thought that about my about my myself about the kind of section like you know if you have to choose one page that to you encapsulates your relationship and I, and I, thought, yeah. I, I bet there's so many moments where readers will have such intense identification with this character's experience even though it is it is rendered in that incredible particularity and it is yeah. you know so far away from where we are temporally and and for some of us geographically nonetheless yeah. the, it, that kind of act of projection is so is is it's seamless you know you, you can't help but make it on some, in some way and i think yeah. that's you know, that is obviously what you hope to you hope to achieve in, in fiction ideally yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um uh let's see um uh <laughs> This is um, my partner, who I think is downstairs. Um, B. Conkle says, what is the relationship of a book like this to a psychotherapeutic or psychoanalytic undertaking? Um, this seems to fit actually just what we were talking about in terms of, you know, um, uh, the mirror text and everything. Um, both are profound and ideally very honest excavations of a personal past, but here it seems uh, much of the point, unlike in therapy or analysis, is not learning any neat lessons, not tidying experience up into understanding. Mm -hmm. um, that, I mean, I think we have touched on this a little bit, that that resistance to meaning and how you know one's one's task in therapy is to sort of create the story and mm -hmm. the parallels and you know it is a kind of um well again this is the lens through which you and i see the world a novelistic crafting <laughs> theme yeah. um and i guess in that way this isn't novelistic in that yeah it does indeed resist a um you know, a, a catharsis for the self, for the, the, the author herself. Um, yeah, it's in, I, I mean, reading the book, I don't know that I would know what the story that Tova Ditlevson is, what the story she tells about herself, if that makes, right. she tells herself about herself. If that yeah. Makes. yeah, I don't know that I would know what that narrative is, even though I feel like, I, I, I mean, I, I, I actually don't feel like I, understand every or know everything about this character at all because she's she, you know it, it's so um pointed and precise the things that she doesn't reveal so there's actually i i do have the sense that there's a great deal i don't know or understand mm -hmm. um but i don't think i even i i don't think that i would say i i know what is her own kind of narrative of, of the self yeah. um, which i think is 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 what ideally psychoanalysis a, a, allows you to produce yeah. in my understanding um yeah. and and which i think is is very useful um i i don't think that's what this book is, is trying to do i mean it's interesting because of course it's written it is written so um far from you know that they, they were written many many years after their the books are written years after the years in which their the events are taking place um but i think the kind of feat of the books is actually the collapsing of, of that distance yeah I mean, to my mind, there's a there's a curious generosity to that, um, by which I mean, um, the the way in which we don't have her account of herself, we don't have her, mm -hmm. you know, and here's when I realized and, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I became an addict because my mom didn't give me enough love or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so awful to have that kind of book. It's just so deadening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, um, uh as a as a sometime analysand it's very fascinating to me and it would be it would be hideous for anyone else you know because it's like that that is it isn't fiction i think the key difference is that you know great fiction and i know this isn't exactly fiction but great literature then allows that the reader the space to to be a bit of an analyst too mm -hmm. you know it is not mm -hmm. a um complete exhausted and hence dead and in that story um mm -hmm. there it's sort of alive with you know the mystery of these omissions mm -hmm. um that to me is what makes the book alive I, I you know i think when you were speaking that really made me think about how you know the really great books are the ones that allow that relationship between the the book and and the and i know it is i i under i know it's a terrible cliche but i think you know, the idea that the book exists in the relationship between the reader and 
And the writer is, I think, the idea of what you just said, the idea that the reader is given access to, to perform that analysis is, is yeah. really a, a lovely way of, of putting it. And I think, I mean, I guess this was what I was badly saying earlier, but the act of exposure is, is always so exciting to me in a, in a piece of fiction. And I think that's exactly the kind of, um, you know, a, a storyline, a story of the self can be very narratively sealed off in some way. And I think, like, as you say, it, it is generous to, to kind of allow that openness in, in some way. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Um, anonymous attendee says, um, <laughs> do you think there's an unfairness to how Ditlifson might be received in English, given that the book seems shadowed by her addiction and suicide? Every review must mention it, and I fear there's a sort of plath fallacy that she could fall prey to. Oh my God, anonymous attendee, yes, you are speaking my language, whoever you are. This was, you know, this was my great fear with this book. I mean, that sounds a little melodramatic, but, um, and I guess this, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier and in terms of, you know, the prurience around suffering. And I did fear that her life would overshadow her work. And I think it's, um, you know, it's testament to the power of this book that even the reviews are probably feel, you know, reviewers probably feel obliged to mention it. Um, to my, I mean, I haven't been exhaustively reading the coverage, but it does seem like, you know, the main story there is just this book is amazing, not mm -hmm. the tragic life. I don't know, is that your sense, Katie, or? I, I have to admit, I haven't been reading all the reviews or maybe any of them, um, <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, I, 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 I somehow forgot <laughs> when I was reading that she, um, that she died by suicide. Actually, yeah. it, it was, and, and that didn't, um, that didn't, and it was a shock to remember in, in yeah. some way. Um, um, but, but the question of, I think that that is a really interesting question of how, how the work will be received here. I mean, one hopes that when, you know, it, that that the the so-called discourse has moved on since the kind of plath narrative was formed. Um, and I, I, I fear that, um, you know, much of the problematic aspect of, of how Sylvia Plath's life was, I mean, I, I, I'm not a plath expert, so I should not, I should probably not say anything, but it is because it was written as, as, as a kind of comparison against the work of her partner yeah. all the time. And that became the dominant narrative. And I actually think there's just no partner in this story who, I mean, even in dependency, what is much more interesting is, is her, is the way she makes addiction almost an articulation of her will. Mm. Um, is almost more alive to me than the kind of evil gaslighting doctor husband in, in, in some way. And, yeah. and so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, I think, I mean, obviously it's, it's a real concern and it's something to think about. That was not my experience of the book, but I don't, yeah. I, again, I don't know exactly how the, how, what the narrative around it in, in America or in, in the UK and in America is, yeah. I have to say. Do you know, is that the story, is that how it's, is she? I don't, know. I don't know, I mean, yeah, as I said, this was, you know, I kind of worried this would be the case. And I feel like there is, there's this laudable impulse, which is to kind of resuscitate or, um, you know, um, discover uh, overlooked female writers. And of course she's hugely famous in her native yeah. country, but yeah. it's only now that she's, she's kind of arriving um, uh, in English um, and you know that's obviously that's a wonderful impulse um, uh, but I think I just fear that there's something a little messed up in that which is like um, you know these women were overlooked because of the um, egregious pain and suffering inflicted upon them because of patriarchy and certainly some of that might be true but then that means almost that we're sort of um, browbeaten, we're impelled to kind of revere them because of the pain they've suffered and because of the injustice of them having been overlooked. And that to me is just such a disservice to the work itself, you know? Um, I mean, I would kind of like it if we just knew nothing about writers and we just read their work, but mm -hmm. 
you and I were talking earlier today about how that is very much not the world we live in. <laughs> um, I, I mean, who, who are the recently kind of excavated writers that you would kind of put in that category? Or, guess, who, who, or who, who have we, who have we been doing that, that to? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I want to be um, respectful here, but, um, <laughs> but maybe that, maybe you don't have to answer that question. Well, I guess I would say I had, I'd had a lot of um, uh, excitement about this book, Divorcing by Susan Taubes. I don't know if you read it. Mm -hmm. I she read a truly tragic story. She committed, she got a, she was reviewed in these, you know, hideous, scathing, sexist, condescending mm -hmm. terms in the Times and then committed suicide shortly after. Awful. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just a bit disappointed with the book itself. And I thought, like, was the, was the sort of buzz I was hearing more one of kind of, you know, this in some sense, um, admirable impulse of kind of feminist rescue, you know? And it's like, well, there are two different things here. There's the life and there's the book and mm -hmm. which one are we paying attention to, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and we can't kind of undo the injustice of the life by praising the book when mm -hmm. maybe the, I mean, I, I felt like that book just needed um, an editor. Um, <laughs> it, it had its wonderful qualities, but I was just expecting something brilliant Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> oh God, I hope I'm not going to get in trouble. But have you have you, <laughs> have you had any sense of this? You know, a kind of rescuing of of over. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think it is a pro a project, um, wh which I think is fundamental. I, I think I, 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 I like as as with you, I fundamentally agree with the project as as a as a whole, I ab absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I'm so alive to the fact that the, the canon, as we understand it, has been, is a product of its time and, mm -hmm. and needs to be rewritten and reformed. And I, I do feel that very strongly. Um, I mean, I, I, I suppose I haven't read, I, I'm embarrassed to say I haven't read this. I, I, I sound like I'm, I'm living in some vacuum of knowing nothing. I wasn't even aware of the kind of, 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 of kind of Ferrari around around the book so I, I I'm not familiar with, with that um I mean I, I suppose I I, I oh, this sounds very goody two-shoes but I, I suppose I feel on balance if you know if, if some writers are overpraised in the overarching project of reshaping a very kind of male white heteronormative canon I think that is okay and I, I suppose I feel like there are many overpraised um, um, I mean there are many overpraised books in in general and many of them are especially uh, you know I mean I do have the experience of reading books that I, I was taught as as canon and then I look back and I think actually I'm not I'm not actually so sure not often but sometimes I do I'm not I'm not I'm not yeah. actually sure a curious experience that I just um I just reread Mao too. I never remember which Delillo I've read, but I think this was a rereading. And yeah. he uses um he uses the word sooty like 25 times in 20 pages. And I'm just like Delillo is fallible, you know. <laughs> Very good to be reminded of these things. It's the kind of disillusionment of <laughs> inspiration. It's like, oh yeah, we're all just I, it, it, I had a, a lovely, I was, I had a, a kind of, I remember it's like a piece of advice that a, a writer once gave me, which, which I repeat to myself all the time. He had a very, very, very successful um, and wonderful and, and very good uh, for, first, first novel. But I just yeah. say successful because he was laid, he was working on his second book under the kind of weight of having had this very successful debut. Yeah. And he said that every morning he would go back into his computer, into his files and he would open up the first draft of the novel yeah. as a reminder to himself of how bad it really was and I, and I think these little mental whatever mental trick you need to do to get yourself to kind of return to the page is is is, is valuable in yeah. as far as that's, I'm concerned that's quite brutal like having to face your first draft every morning. yeah I know I know I know yeah. I mean for me that's like looking at the poems of your childhood <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> I think I think quite often of um uh is it Randall Jarrett the critic uh, who says a a novel is a a prose one work of some length with something wrong with it mm -hmm. um, which I find quite reassuring. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. It's going to be flawed. There's going to be something, at least one thing wrong with it. Well, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think even there's so few perfect novels and yeah. even the perfect novels are not necessarily the, the best ones. And, right. and, and I think the, the novels I admire most, I mean, I'd rather, I, I don't know about you, I'd rather read a novel that's trying for something and failing than yeah, a novel that's kind of playing it safe. But I think even the novels I admire most in the world, there are, I, I, I mean, probably things in them that don't totally work. Yeah. I'm now feel like we're airing our neuroses on our writing practice and we should move on to the next question. <laughs> well, speaking of wonderful novels, anonymous attendee says, a comment then, exclamation point. Um, reading Copenhagen has felt almost exactly like reading Proust in the way that I think Anne Carson said, it's like taking on a second unconscious. Mm -hmm. uh, and they say lovely event. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. um, but Katie, this reminds me of what you were saying about the feeling of childhood reading, just yeah. being, you know, completely overtaken by someone yeah. else's yeah. mind and sensibility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 and that is a kind of really excellent comparison that I had not um, actually made, but it is completely accurate. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's right. It, it, that is, <laughs> these questions are so great. I feel like I need yeah. to cut and paste because they have such great, this, this kind of second unconscious or this kind of layer oh, of consciousness. It was Randall Darrell. I'm sorry, I got the critic's name wrong. <laughs> just somebody just messaged you to say you got it. Um, I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's that, that kind of portal almost opening of, of where suddenly you get access to another yeah. Um, layer onto your an, another set of eyes through which to see the world it, it's, it's such yeah. a naive and childish um, way of thinking about reading but that is for me remains a kind of ideal reading ex experience and I yeah and I think that's always on some level what I'm 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 I'm, I'm looking for a, again now is like a have kind of intense nostalgia for that book that just surpasses my daily life um, that becomes my my reality for you know for a period and 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 there are there are still a handful of books that can do that and this is really one of those for me yeah yeah sure. yeah you said as you were saying um you know it's a kind of childhood experience I, I was thinking um my greatest reading experience is sort of feel like being on drugs you know just like an altered consciousness um but I guess that's what and we we touched on this a little that's what um did Lipson's writing seems to have been for her as well as her addiction and you put yes. that so beautifully earlier that it's the same it seems to be almost the same mechanism a kind of inhabiting a different yeah I, I feel like there's a, and I, I I feel like there's a parallel structure at work at, at work there possibly yeah. yeah yeah um well listen we should probably um let everyone uh, go oh. dinner, whatever <laughs> they are and um, breakfast who, who knows <laughs> Uh, that was absolutely terrific. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Hermione and Katie. Um, I, I am going to be pondering a lot of what we discussed in the end of that. DeLillo, fallible. All right. Uh, it's true. <laughs> um, uh, just to, a note to everybody, um, I posted at the, the start of the event in the chat um, a link to purchase tonight's books, uh, along, very importantly, with pre-order links to Hermione and Katie's books. Um, which come out on the same day in July, if you missed that at the start. Super exciting. Uh, we will see both of you um, on the stage then. And otherwise, uh, uh, everyone just have a lovely night and, um, and uh, read the Dit Lepson, please. Thank you, Hal. Thank you so Thank much. You, Thank you, FSG. Thank you, Camille. Good night. <laughs>